We are. We are. We are cultivate. 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 We are cultivate. Welcome to Ye Old Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stengel. Hello. Hi. So I have two things that I need to pull out of the cubby. Mm -hmm. First, being in true Monday 2024 kickoff vein of awesomeness, my audio last week was horseshit. Because I updated my Vocaster software, mm -hmm. and before we started recording, it booted my mic and instead went to mm -hmm. a default mic, which is the microphone in my monitor. So, yeah, yeah, not even the laptop, just the no. monitor. Yeah, because I'm on an old school PC setup right now. Mm -hmm. So I am very aware that the audio was horrible. The alternative was that I could sound like a robot. <laughs> and have portions of my audio fall off. Because mm -hmm. trust me, I spent well over an hour trying to fix my audio. So it didn't sound like horse mm -hmm. shit, but I wasn't able to salvage it. So if there are any audio engineers in the audience that would be interested in taking last week's audio and trying to fix it for me and remaster it so I can re-upload it, hit me up. I'm not going to say no. Yeah. And to everyone on YouTube who left extremely hurtful comments, I see you, I hear you, and that hurt. And the second part of our cubby is I did the bad news first. Um, we're ending on a good note. So okay, good. We have a new buy me a coffee monthly sustainer. What? The lovely Carolyn, also known as Charlie, which I love for a variety of reasons. Yeah. And she said. I love listening to the wide range of cases, most of which I have never heard of. And being British, I love listening to you pronounce UK town names. <laughs> Fair. Fair. That's the real reason. That's yeah. the reason. Oh that's, my God, yeah. that's amazing. Great hosts, Incredible. fascinating tales, well-researched, informative, and fun. Thank you, Charlie. That is extremely kind of you to say. So if you would also like to be a monthly sustainer like mm -hmm. Charlie and our friend Elizabeth, you can go over to buymeacoffee.com slash ye old crime. That's all one word. And you can choose to either be a sustainer on the $1 level, the $5 level. We don't have tons of extras, but we do send you a fun little package in the mail and mm -hmm. send you some behind the scenes stuff. So yeah. there's that. And on that note, I am going to segue us to the topic mm -hmm. of this week, which is Charles Julius Guiteau. Okay. I love how you know nothing because this is going to be the wildest ride. Like, oh, no. Buckle up. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, no long pig, but buckle up. Like, it's good. It's going to be, it's gonna be Thank great. Thank you. All right. Information was pulled from the following sources. A 2023 New York Post article by Todd Farley. 2022 All That's Interesting article by Kalina Fraga. 2021 Timeless Travels magazine article by Owen Dwyer. 2017 Garfield Observer article by Todd Arrington. 2016 National Archives article by Jay Bellamy. 2015 The Atlantic article by Brian Resnick. Britannica, the Gilder Lerman Institute of American History. There were two links from there. The Library of Congress. UMKC School of Law Famous Trials article by Professor Douglas Owender and Wikipedia. And links to all of these articles will be included in the show notes. If you want a playlist of all our episodes on YouTube, click the link in our show notes or in our link tree and subscribe today for not only a list of our full catalog, but a separate list as well, just of our Can You Crack the Cramp Word segments. Charles Julius Guiteau was born to parents Luther Wilson Guiteau and Jane August Howe on September 8, 1841 in Freeport, Illinois. His mother passed away when he was seven after suffering from psychosis mm -hmm. for much of her life. Oh, so is that implying yeah, it suicide? Said, it said that she died of brain fever. So 
That could be any number of things. Yeah. I mean, it kind of heavily implied that mental illness ran in the family. Got it. Yeah, I suppose. Because at that time, they, they probably didn't realize that, like, psychosis can't kill you like that. <laughs> they didn't really have classifications for, like, schizophrenia and stuff yet. Mm -hmm. just, You're insane. That's kind of the yeah. frame we're in right now. His father remarried to Harriet Marie Blood in 1853, and the pair had two children together, Flora in 1854, making her 13 years younger than Charles, and Luther Jr. in 1856, mm -hmm. making him 15 years younger than Charles. And a junior. And a junior. He didn't get, yeah, that, he didn't get junior that status. Wasn't, that wasn't rubbing salt in the new family womb. Yeah. Wound. The, I love me some salted womb. Let me tell you what, <laughs> especially when it's in the family. <laughs> oh my god! Okay. Long pig. All right, moving on. <laughs> Charles was an awkward youth, short of stature. It said he was like around five feet tall, five feet five, redheaded. That wouldn't have been. Oh, oh. And, yeah. And had a bit of a stammer, much to the displeasure of his father who would beat him regularly when Charles was unable to say a word correctly or without a stutter. Damn. He would also beat him for any imagined religious slip-ups, such as not being able to recite his prayers properly. Great. Mm -hmm. It kind of fell off in my notes, but his dad's side of the family were like French Huguenots. So like, okay, very anti-Catholic, anti-Crown. So kind of think... French Puritans, kind of like that kind of. Okay. It says like Calvinism was like one of the things that kind of fell within what they believe mm. in, but so that's kind of where we're at. Got it. Very religious. We'll just say that. Extremely religious, very strict father. Mm -hmm. Extremist, kind of culty, yes. typical offshoot. Yes. Charles spent much of his early life working for his father before attending the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Since he was so socially awkward, he didn't fit in well at college and left school mm -hmm. a year later in 1860 before relocating to New York, where he joined the Oneida Community Sex Commune at the age of 19. Are you familiar with the Oneida Community Commune? No. Oh my God. Okay. But a sex commune at that time would have been definitely woo-woo. It's like the 1860s version of the 1960s free love. For the 1970s really? free love. Yeah. Like a hundred years earlier. So, Whoa. fun fact. The Oneida community's leader, John Noyes, is someone that Charles worshipped. Quote, I have perfect, entire, and absolute confidence in him in all things. End quote. That's what Charles said. Okay. I plan to go into the sex cult in more detail in a future episode because there's just so okay. much to it. I'm sure. I'm sure you were like... This would be like a four-parter if you included it. I knew about it before this episode, mm -hmm. and I was reminded of it because of looking at a picture of Charles, and mm -hmm. I was like, why does his creepy face like look so familiar? And mm -hmm. that's what clicked. And I was like, holy shit, this is a twofer. There's a sex call, mm -hmm. and what's actually going to happen? And I got really excited. Okay, so <laughs> one of the tenants of... The Oneida community, which was this utopian society, utopian mm -hmm. socialist society. And his desire to get into this cult is likely because of his father. Oh, like totally. usually children of, of extreme backgrounds seek out cults mm -hmm. later in life because that's all they know. One of their tenets was that traditional marriage was banned and they practiced mm. regulated promiscuity and regulated okay. emissions. I don't like that word. Yeah. As much. Well, or regulated ejaculate, I guess, if you want to yeah, I guess. get yeah. real gross about it. Regulated. Second fun fact, the women of the commune gave mm. Charles the nickname Charles Get Out because no one wanted to sleep with him. Oh. Third fun fact, they also practiced mutual criticism, which was when a member of the community would be put in the middle of a room and forced to sit and listen as the remaining members of the commune cataloged all of their faults while they remained completely silent. They could not respond. 
So this is just modern day Comedy Central, all of it. Yeah, you're getting roasted, people who are getting picked on because of how they look and uh, yeah. unregulated, regulated, part, multiple part. Like, so it's just a really yeah. mean polygamist cult. cult. Yeah, polyamory. It's yeah. like a, for, a forced polyamory. It, uh, it's a I choose you type of polyamory. Like the women decided. Okay, good. So okay, I, like, I, won't, I don't like, want to spoil too much for that episode, but yeah, like, okay, okay, yeah, okay. They, got, they got to choose. Anyway. Okay, good. Makes me feel a little better. So in 1875, a journalist named Charles Nordhoff noted that he once saw a young man that he dubbed Charles mm-hmm. faint after listening to the list of his shortcomings over the course of several hours in one of these mutual oh. criticisms. Oh my God. And I think it was heavily implied that it was our Charles yeah. that he was talking about. So kind of keep that tucked away in the back of your mind. Mm. In 1868, so he joined in 1860. So in 1868, mm-hmm. after leaving the commune for good, he'd left and gone back twice over the span of that time. Yeah, I bet. I bet he was like, I can be better. And he left to be better and come back and they still didn't like him. Well, part of it too was he didn't like to have to work. He didn't feel like he needed to work. And they were like, no, you have to work. So that caused mm-hmm. a little but bit of friction. Like, but I'm, fi- I'm five foot tall and I'm a baby. <laughs> yeah, so that was part of it. But he attempted to start the nation's first theocratic newspaper, the Daily Theocrat, before moving back to oh. Illinois so he could pursue a career as a lawyer. Great. Wow. Th- this man is just, I guess the red hair was because he was a walking red flag. His whole oh life. my God. He Dude. was a walking red flag. He came out a red flag. Mm-hmm. God said, watch this one. <laughs> yeah. Not that we're saying all redheads are red flags, but this guy no, particularly was a walking red flag. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. To the surprise of pretty much everyone who knew him after working several months as a law clerk, He was able to sit the bar exam, which at that time consisted of just three questions. And after getting two of them right, he passed and became a licensed attorney. Oh, my God. He reminds me of that doctor on The Simpsons. Yeah. Hi, everybody. (laughs) Charles worked as a crooked bill collector to make money as he struggled to turn a profit as a lawyer. Mm. He often pocketed the money he was sent to collect and spent most of his time in court spouting theology instead of actually doing what he was supposed to get paid for. You know, lawyering. So, Mm. you know, things lawyers do. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. In 1869, Charles married Anna B. Bunn, a librarian at the local YMCA who was originally born in Leicester, England. I don't know how she ended up in Illinois. I don't know. I but feel, she's so cute sounding. Like, mm-hmm. oh no. The pair were married in Freeport, so they're still in Illinois, when he was mm-hmm. 28 and she was 17. Oh God, that's why. Oh no. Their marriage was doomed to fail as he was both verbally and physically abusive to her, often locking her in a closet for several hours anytime she would question him about his bizarre actions. Mm-hmm. He would also drag her around the house by her hair yelling at her, quote, I am your master, submit yourself to me, end quote. They got divorced in 1874, when Anna could no longer live with him and his bad temper, and the fact that he cheated on her several times and slept with a sex worker. That was kind of like the last straw for her, was the sex worker. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I guess that kind of makes sense, because reputation at that time was more important than physical safety. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so having people know that he was with a sex worker was worse than them knowing that she was beaten at home. Yeah. No. Oh, she has such a cute little name. Like, I, I know. feel really bad for her. She ended up, like, having a good life. Like, she... Good. They, okay, good. I didn't put it in here. She moved off to Colorado, got remarried. It's a whole, whole good thing. Okay, good. Charles moved to Wisconsin following his divorce. <sighs> to live with his sympathetic sister, Frances, and her husband. Mm. That all changed in 1875. (laughs) So, not long after. As Frances was bent over to pick up some firewood that Charles had knocked over, he slowly raised an axe above her head with a wild animal look in his eyes. 
Frances fled her home and refused to support him anymore. She intended to send him to Chicago to have him committed to an asylum, but he instead fled her home before she could do so. Once he learned that that's what she was going to do, he was like, I'm out. Yeah. Well, and with him being a man, too, he probably would be able to convince people that she was just being crazy. Two years later, in 1877. Mm -hmm. Still in Wisconsin? No. He decided Mm -hmm. that his true calling was preaching God's work, specifically the teachings of John Noyce of the Oneida community. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The community that really liked him. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He plagiarized John Noy's writings, traveling from town to town to try and evangelize. After Mm -hmm. failing to gain any sort of following, he moved to Boston, where he attempted to become an insurance salesman, but he failed at that as well. He's got like just the classic markings of of quite like every serial killer ever. Mm -hmm. Like any violent man ever. This is all of their origin stories in one. He reminds me of Carl Panzram, who would move around all over the place, mm-hmm. change his name, but he used the same name Carl several times, and that's how they were able to catch him eventually, because it was like, why would you use the same alias? Yeah. You dumb. Anyway, according to a pamphlet written about him by Professor A.E. Fru Mully, during this time mm-hmm. when he was evangelizing, quote, his religious motto was apparently... It is more blessed to beg, borrow, or steal than to pay one's debts. Cincinnati, Hartford, Connecticut, Buffalo. Every large city was successfully visited by him. At each place he Mm. left an undying record in the shape of hotel and printing bills. End quote. Yeah, because, you know, he's helping them. So you're welcome. My presence is a present. (laughs) Mm -hmm. He would, like, skip town. There were so many mentions of him, like, going to restaurants and skipping on the bill having a bunch of stuff Mm -hmm. printed for him and then like never paying the bill, renting spaces and never paying for anything. Like he was just constantly Mm -hmm. skipping town. Great. So while living in Boston, he developed an interest in politics, specifically the Republican Party and the stalwarts. Great. He wrote a pamphlet about Ulysses S. Grant and why he should be the next leader of the country. Because at the time he Mm. was the front runner. So he decided to board a ship for New York where he could offer his help at the National Republican Committee in New York City. He was Mm -hmm. like, I need to help these guys. They need me. Right. Don't worry. I know everything there is to know. I'm the man with the plan. I'm a lawyer, insurance salesman, theologist, newspaper man. I'm a triple quadruple threat. Yeah. With this in mind, he boarded the steamship Stonington on July 11th, 1880, bound for New York. Mm -hmm. While the ship was moored near the Connecticut shoreline, Hidden under a heavy veil of fog, she was struck by another steamer known as the Narragansett head-on. This collision resulted in the deaths of 80 people on both ships. Oh my god. 80 people each? Total. So from both ships, 80 people passed away. No, still like horrific, but like, thank god it wasn't 160. Yeah. I mean, it was still very bad. Yeah. No, that's horrible. Yeah. Because you you would assume that that's... That would have been like highway collision at that point, just because of how common that travel would have been at the time. Yeah, because essentially the Stonington was like at a dead stop. It was just at the dock. And so the Narragansett just got hit. hit it head on because it couldn't see it in the fog. So they had no way to stop. They were going full tilt. Charles, who had been on the deck of the Stonington when it was struck, viewed his survival as a sign from God that he was meant for great things. No, God said, damn it, I missed. He's like, fuck. He's like, this red flag. (laughs) I keep missing this flag. When General James Garfield was selected as the alternative candidate, Charles was still all in to support him. Mm -hmm. Charles would regularly haunt the Republican Party offices in New York City, begging to be able to help the election in whatever way he could. Party officials finally, because he like wrote this big pamphlet that originally Mm -hmm. was for Grant, but then he just crossed out Grant's name and just changed it to Garfield. So he didn't actually change Mm -hmm. the script. Like he just kept it the same. Because why personalize it to the actual candidate? You know, right? Like all the same. He already wrote something Mm -hmm. beautiful. Why would he change it? So they decided enough was enough, and they let him deliver this rambling, incoherent speech to a small contingent of black voters. (gasps) Oh, that's that's so mean. 
So then Charles was of the opinion that his speech helped Garfield win the election. Oh, yeah. Those poor people that that he had to talk at. Mm -hmm. As a result of this, Charles wanted to be compensated in some way for his contribution. And how did Charles want to be compensated? Uh Well, in one letter that he wrote to President Garfield regarding a post to serve as the ambassador to Vienna, Austria, he stated, quote, On the principle of first come, first served, I have faith that you will give this application favorable consideration, end quote. What? It's not like a tag you're it scenario. And he has no idea who you are. He doesn't know you. Right. (laughs) What? You are some rando. So Charles followed James Garfield to Washington, D.C., where he was sworn in as the 20th president of the United States on March 4th, 1881. Mm -hmm. At this time in history, ordinary people could just walk into the White House and the State Department building. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was the thing. So after moving to Washington, and this is D.C. for people that are unfamiliar, uh, Charles Mm -hmm. would visit any number of the political buildings in the Capitol, telling anyone who would stop to listen that he deserved to be given a diplomatic post. Mm. Yeah, I bet those conversations were riveting. Mm Mm-hmm. Charles personally visited the president at the executive office, handing him a copy of his pamphlet that he'd written, quote, to help him win the election, end quote, Mm. on which he simply wrote his name and the words Paris consulship. So he changed his mind and he's like, now he wants to be a part of Paris and not Vienna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Less singing, maybe. I don't know. Maybe he's like, you know, I like phallic things and they have the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Well, I was just thinking, you know, maybe he does have a death wish and he really wants to look like a child, like a small child uh, to a starving French pig. Yes. And uh, get his face ripped off. (laughs) Yeah. I like living on the wild side. I am a living red flag after all. I have heard about those bull weevils at that that sacred winery. You could convince them to leave for God. He then stated that it was his application for the position before leaving without saying another word. Like, this is my application, this pamphlet that I wrote. Yeah, mic drop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The next day, he wrote a letter to the Secretary of State, James Blaine, claiming that he'd spoken the day before to the president, and he claimed the right to the Paris consulship due to his speech and how it had led to President Garfield's victory in the election. Yeah, sure. Did he deliver this via carrier pigeon? I don't know. All I just know is he, he gave it to him in some fashion. Oh my God. Charles would visit both the White House and the State Department almost daily, pleading his case yeah. to anyone who would listen regarding mm-hmm. why he should be appointed to the consul. He even showed up at a reception at the White House and introduced himself to Lucretia Garfield, James Garfield's wife, stating that he, quote, was one of the men that made Mr. Garfield president, end quote. Mm, yeah. How creeped out was that poor woman after she found out who he was? Like, it makes you wonder, like, when conversing with him, if you if it's one of those, like, chills down your spine kind of moments where, or like, your hair is standing on end, like, danger, danger, danger. <laughs> I would imagine. I mean, yeah. yeah. In a quote from The Trial of the Assassin, Gito, quote, he had no source of income. No lecturing, no books to sell, no bills to collect. He had no family. He never had any friends. His clothes, shabby enough when he reached Washington, were deteriorating. Even in March, with snow on the ground, he went about without boots or an overcoat. By June, his worn sleeves were pulled down over his hands and his coat buttoned up to his neck, for he had no collar and possibly lacked a shirt as well. End quote. Okay, if he looked like that too, there was there was nobody nobody in that whole at like Washington D.C. at any point was like maybe we should commit this guy who's clearly a vagabond that could be a danger to the leaders of our country. And I'm sure he was one of who knows how many people that came across. Right, that, you know. Yeah, but he's consistent. Like he's always there. Yeah, yeah. Because if he if he was like a true quote unquote like vagabond, you know, you'd be like, oh, he's gonna hop on a train soon. 
we'll be rid of him. But he was there all the time. Yeah. And he obviously wasn't staying anywhere. No. He was staying there somewhere. Yeah. Like the bushes or something. Who knows? To the surprise of no one, he was never Mm -hmm. given a diplomatic post. Yeah. In fact, during one visit to the State Department on May 14th, 1881, after receiving several letters and almost daily visits from Charles, James Blaine, the Secretary of State, flew into a rage and screamed at him, quote, never bother me again about the Paris consulship as long as you live, end quote. Yeah, I'm surprised that didn't happen sooner. Yeah, this is like three months. Of Two daily. and a half, three months. Yeah. Additionally, President Garfield was very publicly squabbling with New York's Senator Roscoe Conkling, who wanted to secure the cushy job of collector of the Port of New York. Hmm. Charles became convinced that the president was going to do away with the patronage system, where you could, like, move up in, you know, the pecking order, under the Mm -hmm. table type of thing, which he was counting on to secure this position in either Vienna or Paris. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Likely next step, you know? Yeah. Charles wrote letters to the president asking that the Secretary of State be removed from office for his impertinence, but none of his letters were answered. In the meantime, the president's private secretary issued orders to the ushers at the White House that Charles Guiteau was no longer allowed entry. Okay, good. What was that, like three, four months? Three months at this point. They were like, yeah, this guy, he he needs to not be here anymore. We would have so many dead presidents if if this kind of system still existed. There's no way. We wouldn't have any leaders ever. It was at that time that Charles was convinced that it was another sign from God that he needed to kill President Garfield so that his vice president, Chester A. Arthur, could be sworn in as president instead and then give him the position that he so rightfully deserved. Got it. That's why he's three named. He also attempted to publish his religious manuscript, The Truth, a companion to the Bible. How a humbled, a humbled title. You know, it's just a companion to the Bible. You know. It's just mansplaining the Bible, you know? Who doesn't love a companion? I got this. Mm -hmm. Which was actually just another plagiarized version of a book that the Oneida cult leader had written. Mm. You know? Yeah. So after somehow being able to print off a thousand copies and failing to sell them in Boston... He decided yeah. to return to Washington to assassinate the president. Oh, okay. So he's like, you know, nobody picked these up, but it's cool. I'm just going to leave him here, go murder him, and then everybody's going to want to buy it. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. It really does. The birds told him this. this yes. Time, yeah. Birds don't exist, Maddie. They're not real. No. <laughs> they, were, they were the prototype for the birds, the birds of now. So to prepare for the assassination... Charles made Mm. a point of purchasing a gun on June 15th that he thought would look good in a museum. Wow. Really thinking ahead. He is. Would it look good in a museum in Vienna or Paris? Maybe both. I mean, it is phallic. So I would assume Paris, right? Like keep going with Mm -hmm. like, you know, the phallic theme. Wait until you hear what kind of gun it was, Maddie. Oh my God. It was an English bulldog five shooter or a snub nosed Mm. 45 caliber revolver. With a fancy ass ivory handle. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was the president. Like, what is he going to get murdered by, like, a pea shooter? Something yeah. you would steal yeah. off a corpse? No, I don't think so. Uh, you have to be respectful when you murder, you know? The leader of the country. At least murder them with, yeah. with nice things. Yeah. yeah. If you're going to assassinate me, assassinate me with something nice. Come All right. On. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Do it for your country. Do it for your country, cool. you know? Following this purchase, using $15 that he'd borrowed. Yeah, he was definitely going to pay them back. Yeah. <laughs> he was so going to pay them back. He wrote, quote, an address to the American people, end quote, on June 16th, mm. in which he pled the case for Garfield's assassination, stating that he was ungrateful to the stalwarts and that once Garfield was gone and Arthur was put into power for political necessity, then, quote, Mm -hmm. I leave my justification to God and the American people, end quote. Yeah, so he's like, hey, Americans, I'm going to murder this guy because he sucks, and then we're going to get the cool guy, and you're welcome. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this for you. Yeah. 
It's not my idea. It was God's idea. That was just actually he that was just a gaslighting letter to try to gaslight the American people and thinking it's their idea. Like, don't worry, I know what you need. God and I know. I'm just gonna go murder this guy real quick. You won't even miss him. That'll be great. It's gonna be so great, you guys. Charles waited for the perfect opportunity to strike and learned from a newspaper write-up on June 30th that President Garfield would be catching a 9.30 a.m. train on July 2nd headed for Massachusetts. So. Is this also just like when the Secret Service was really created? (laughs) I would hope they were created after this because, yeah, let's publish the president's every move. We still kind of do that, right? Like, because they want people around the area where they're going to be. But the difference is there's usually FBI or some sort of private security or like they're the entire week before casing that place. We also don't say how they're getting there and like right. when they're leaving and when they're <laughs> arriving and where they're staying. Right. Like we don't right. share that information now. Security guard Greg, <laughs> Greg A, not Greg B, is going to go <laughs> knock on his door, pick him up, make sure he's buckled. So on the morning of July 2nd, 1881, Charles wrote a letter to the White House for Vice President Arthur and another one to William T. Sherman, who was a Civil War hero regarding the, quote, sad necessity, end quote, of him needing to kill the president. Oh, a preemptive sorry for your loss? Yeah, like, I'm sorry I had to do this. Wow, he is so thoughtful and thorough. So thoughtful. First apologizing to the American people and now his best friends, like... Yeah, personal apologies. In the letter addressed to William, he asked him to, quote, take possession of the jail, end quote, following Charles's inevitable arrest, yeah. citing, again, the political necessity of it. Yeah. No, you can just, like, let me write out. In response, General Sherman stated, quote, I don't know the writer, never heard of him or saw him, to my knowledge, end quote. Yeah. But, I mean, this plan, had he let anybody know is very thorough and and more well thought out than I would have anticipated. Exactly. Like sending a letter to the guy in charge of prisons to be like, listen, I know. So like the gun is still smoking, right? They throw me in here. I'm already the consulate. So you just need to let me out and like have the key ready. Yeah. And then I'll marry the widow of a president and I'll take her to Paris and she'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Win-win. I'll drop off my gun at the museum on the way there. You guys, I got it. Like, I'll even give you, like, the holster that I came with, you know? I'll sign it. signed copies of the speech that I wrote. Yeah, don't worry. Hello. I have all these books in Boston. I know. So (laughs) after placing both letters in his pocket, he Mm. headed to the Baltimore and Potomac Railway Station. And he got there at 8.30 a.m., where he found President Garfield in the company of the Secretary of State, James G. Blaine. And a bag servant. Oh, no. As we read in the paper, President Garfield was going to travel to Williams College in Massachusetts to attend his 25-year class reunion, mm. bringing his two teenage sons, James and Harry, with him. Oh, God. After sneaking up behind the pair, Garfield and Blaine, mm-hmm. Charles shot the president twice, once in the elbow and once in the lower back, where the bullet lodged itself in his pancreas. Oh, fuck. Getting shot in the elbow? That has to be one of the cruelest fucking things. Yeah. As the first shot rang out, the president cried, quote, My God, what is this? End quote. <laughs> right? Following the president's collapse, Charles turned and head towards the 6th Street exit. Yeah, casually. Upon hearing screams of, quote, Stop him, he shot the president, end quote, He was quickly apprehended by a local police officer. He told the authorities during his arrest, Mm. quote, I am a stalwart of stalwarts. Mm. Arthur is president now, end quote. Yeah, I'm sure they loved that. The president was first moved to a room above the train station to be examined, Mm -hmm. but was then quickly moved back to the White House where his wife was summoned, because I guess she was somewhere else. During a medical examination, the president assured one of his sons that, quote, the upper story is all right. It is only the hull that was damaged, end quote. (laughs) And honestly, he was right. The wounds that he sustained were entirely survivable 
had the doctors that were treating him sanitize their hands and equipment. Yeah. Well, and this was post-Civil War, too, so people that did that were probably really heavily out of practice doing it the right way for a long time in, like, emergency situations. According to Anna Doty, who was a curator at the Mütter Museum in Philadelphia, quote, his doctors were the best doctors, Mm -hmm. meaning old school. They had trained before the theory of antisepsis, Mm -hmm. so they were not taking the necessary precautions. They were not sterilizing instruments. They were not sterilizing hands, end quote. Yeah, sepsis, still number one. His doctors were also of the belief that people could be fed rectally, so they gave President Garfield several beef broth enemas. Horrific. And your elbow's like all fucked up. And I'm sorry, there's actually a saying um, that surgeons and like doctors learn in medical school called don't touch the pee, which is don't touch the pancreas. Because if you fuck with the pancreas at any point in like any surgery ever, you touch it, it flames up and like it just ruins everything. President James Garfield passed away on September 19th, 1881. How many days? At 10.35 p.m. after enduring 80 days of excruciating pain, he was several pounds thinner and he died after having suffered a fatal heart attack, massive hemorrhaging, and likely blood poisoning. It was just slow sepsis. Hey, don't touch... Yeah, I can't. The pancreas. This whole time, Charles had been in jail. And due to concerns that a lynching might happen, officials had Charles move to a brick cell that only had a small opening at the top of a bulletproof oak door. I don't know why you're trying to protect him so hard. Well, you want to see justice, right? Mm. Anyway, (laughs) on September 11th, 1881... Prison guard William Mason fired at Charles, but missed. Damn. He was court-martialed, but the public very much supported his actions. Like, they actually sent his wife, like, gifts. Yeah. Charles Guiteau was formally indicted for the murder of President James Garfield on October 14th, 1881. The prosecution was led by George Corkill, who stated that Charles was just a deadbeat looking for attention and got it by killing the president. When asked on July 9th if he thought that Charles was insane, he was quoted as saying, quote, he's no more insane than I am, end quote. As you can imagine, as the most hated man in America, Mm. no one really jumped at the chance to defend Charles. In fact, the only person willing to do so was his own brother-in-law, George Scoville, who didn't have a whole lot of courtroom experience. And Charles also acted as his own co-counsel. That poor Wisconsin man. Yeah, so this is the husband of Mm -hmm. his sister that he tried to kill with an axe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In a quote from Famous Trials, quote, George Scoville asked the court for a continuance to gather witnesses for the defense. He told Judge Walter Cox that the defense intended to make two primary arguments, that Guiteau was legally insane Mm -hmm. and that the president's death resulted from medical malpractice, not Guiteau's shooting. Judge Cox granted the defense motion and set the trial for November, end quote. Mm-hmm. The trial began exactly a month later on November 14th, and as you can imagine, was a bit of a farce. Yeah. Charles would often scream obscenities in court, and at one point even broke out into the song John Brown's Body. Mm. He also passed notes to courtroom attendees asking for their advice. <laughs> like, who the fuck is this guy? Charles gave a pretty fiery defense regarding Mm. why he did what he did, Mm -hmm. claiming that it was an act of God and that he was just doing his will. Quote, the doctors killed Garfield. I just shot him. End quote. Yeah. Yeah. He he just, you know, got the ball rolling. I'm surprised he didn't want to take full responsibility, though. That's what he loves to do is take credit for other people's things all the time. I mean, he can't take credit for God, right? No. But he didn't take credit for the doctors killing him. That's crazy to me. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't the one sticking his dirty ass fingers in the guy's back. So. Yeah. Yeah. So this wasn't just a case of was he guilty or not, because he very clearly was. Right. But it became more about his mental health. Was he culpable and capable of murder? So the prosecution supported the McNaughton test. So the McNaughton Rule was established in the UK in 1843 by the House of Lords. According to Cornell Law School, 
quote, under the McNaughton test, all defendants are presumed to be sane unless they can prove that at the time of committing the criminal act, the defendant's state of mind caused them to, one, not know what they were doing when they committed said act, or two, that they knew what they were doing, but did not know that it was wrong. A common Mm. example for the second prong is if a person is acting on orders from God, end quote. So the prosecution, which included prosecutor John K. Porter, argued that Charles was smart enough to recognize that murder was a crime. Therefore, he should be sentenced. Hmm. John Gray, who was the superintendent of the Utica State Hospital, or the asylum, and the Mm -hmm. chief medical witness for the prosecution, stated, quote, I see nothing but a life of moral degradation, moral obliquity, profound selfishness, and disregard for the rights of others. I see no evidence of insanity, but simply a life swayed by his own passions, end quote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not going to argue with that. Mm -mm. The defense called upon a man named Edward Charles Spitzka, who was fiercely against the use of the McNaughton rule. Although he agreed with John Gray's assessment that Charles had lived an immoral life, he believed he suffered from moral insanity, or what we would call sociopathy. Mm. And what we now know is just narcissism. (laughs) Yeah. But like not. Yeah. He believed that his condition should be pitied, like, quote, the congenital cripple who was born speechless or with one leg shorter than the other, end quote. Wow. Yeah. To watch this court case live. <laughs> oh my God. Edward was of the mind that there was some sort of deformity in Charles's brain that was causing his moral insanity. During the trial, Charles believed that the general public, as well as the new president, Chester Arthur, would take his side. Understanding that he did what he did because it was God's will. Right. He was convinced that he would be granted a presidential pardon and even Mm. started putting together notes for a lecture tour. Mm -hmm. And he was even planning to run for president himself in 1884. Yeah. I mean, the man thinks of everything, you know, plans A through A through Z. He even went so far has to place an ad in the New York Herald looking for a wealthy Christian woman under the age of 30 to take Mm. as a wife. Yeah, awesome. Closing arguments begin on January 12th, 1882. The jury rejected Charles's plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, and after deliberating for an hour, Mm. they found him guilty on January 25th, 1882, of the first-degree murder of President James Garfield before they sentenced him to death by hanging. In response, Charles was quoted as saying they were, quote, low, consummate jackasses, end quote, Mm. and screamed at the judge, quote, I am not guilty of the charge set forth in the indictment. It was mm-hmm. God's act and not mine, and God will take care of it, end quote. He sure will. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think this might be what's happening. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Uh-oh. Charles's appeals were rejected on May 22nd. Mm, yeah. On June 1st, 1882, Charles wrote a poem called My Case that he intended to have published in the Saturday Star. It was a total of six pages and was never published in its entirety. Mm -hmm. But here are a few stanzas just to give you an idea of how unhinged he had become. Even more so. Quote, Today before my God I stand, a patriot and a Christian man, Mm -hmm. condemned by men to die for obeying God's command. Mm -hmm. Moses killed a man. This made Pharaoh mad, and Moses he would slay. God kept Moses. He will me. I fear no man. Uh Some think me a devil, some a lunatic, some an inspired patriot. The last is right, and I stick to it. I command all men everywhere to believe it under penalty of God's wrath. End quote. Wow. It's about to get salty. Yeah. On June 30th, 1882, the day Charles Julius Guiteau was to be hanged, Mm. he was permitted to recite another poem that he had written that was titled, quote, I am going to the Lordy, end quote. To the Lordy. Oh my gosh, nicknames. Cute. Quote, I am going to the Lordy. I am so glad. I am going to the Lordy. I am so glad. 
Mm. I am going to the Lordy. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. I am going to the Lordy. I love the Lordy with all my soul. Glory, hallelujah. And that is the reason I am going to the Lord. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. I am going to the Lord. I saved my party and my land. Glory, hallelujah. But they have murdered me for it. And that is the reason I am going to the Lordy. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. I am going to the Lordy. I wonder what I will do when I get to the Lordy. I guess that I will weep no more when I get to the Lordy. Hmm. Glory, hallelujah. I wonder what I will see when I get to the Lordy. Hmm. I expect to see most glorious things beyond all earthly conception when I am with the Lordy. Hmm. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. I am with the Lord, end quote. And that's when they kicked him off the stand. <laughs> Yeah, after reciting his poem, the hood was put over his head, yeah. the noose tightened around his neck before the trap door was opened. Yeah. He was 40 years old at the time of his death. <laughs> Doctors quickly conducted an autopsy on Charles' remains. Yeah, I bet. So, like, what does this guy look like on the inside? <laughs> yeah. Since everyone wanted to know what turned him into a killer. Mm. This is also when phrenology was a thing. Yep. So they were like taking pictures of his head yep. and like sending it out to people so they could be like, oh, this is why he did this. Mm -hmm. But during his autopsy, doctors discovered that Charles had syphilis, which he could have contracted from his numerous sexual encounters with sex workers. Yeah. For those that don't know, if left untreated, syphilis can infect the brain and cause mm -hmm. mental instability. Just kind of eats away at it. Doctors noted that the dura matter that surrounded his brain was thicker, which is a common characteristic of neurosyphilis. Mm -hmm. There were also damaged blood vessels discovered on several spots on his brain. Yeah, I bet he had zero frontal lobe work. Frontal lobe work. George Paulson, the former chair of neurology at Ohio State University, reviewed Charles's autopsy records in 2006. He believes it more likely that Charles suffered from schizophrenia mm -hmm. and narcissism, which is not a surprise to anybody at this point. Right. Well, and if his mom had psychosis, she likely had schizophrenia. Charles willed his body to a sympathetic local minister under the condition that he be provided a proper burial. Hmm. A secret grave site was chosen in the subcellar of the army jail, and Charles was buried there, at least until he was dug up in secret by authorities who had learned of the location. Mm. His body was boiled in a chemical solution to remove all of the flesh, except the brain which they saved in a jar, mm -hmm. and the skull was set aside before the rest of the remains were boxed up and put away in the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington, D.C. Oh, Okay. So it's just on a shelf somewhere. Yeah. Today, Charles's brain is currently in a jar at the Mütter Museum in Philadelphia, and his skull is located at the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Never made it to France or Vienna, did he? No. Mm. And that is Charles Julius Guiteau, who assassinated President James Garfield. Pretty cool guy. Yeah. Now I want to see a picture of him. He's got crazy eyes. So, oh, I'm like, sure. Not I am sure. at all. Yeah. Looking for more content? You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. If you'd like to see pictures from this week's episode, not to mention bonus content and funny memes, make sure to follow us on Twitter at yieldcrimepod and on Facebook and Instagram at yieldcrimepodcast. On TikTok, of course you are. Follow us at yieldcrimepodcast. Hey, creepy people. This is PNW Haunts and Homicides. I'm Caitlin. And I'm Cassie. Together, we explore stories of the paranormal and true crime throughout the Pacific Northwest. For each episode, we do a tarot reading to help us gain some insight on the topic as we share the facts of the case and our interpretations. You can find our episodes featuring true stories from infamous cases such as the misdeeds of Boeing, as well as lesser known true crime cases like the murders in Tunnel 13 as well as our spooky stories from Pike Place and Raven's Manor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else you'd like to listen. Have, Have a, a creepy, creepy ass day. day. This month's podcast plug is the PNW Haunts and Homicides podcast. Join Caitlin and Cassie as they chat about true crime, the paranormal, and all kinds of spooky shit in the Pacific Northwest.
They're just two normalish friends who wanted more local, creepy stories, so they never sleep or leave their houses again. And you can check out the link in our show notes to give them a listen. And this week's listener question comes from our friend Carrie Ann. She sent us like so many good questions. Yeah. So like we've got quite Thanks, a few. Carrie Ann. If you want to send us some questions, there is a link in our show notes so you can submit your own um, on a Google form. You can also DM us. You can email us. I'm sure there's some other way to contact Shout us. Shout us but... on the streets if you see us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or on the Discord. On our Discord if you oh, want yeah. to message us there. So anyway, Carrie Ann wants to know, if you could remake a film, what film would you remake? Oh my god. Right? Remake a film? Harvey. Is that the, the one with the giant bunny? Yeah. The the puka. The, it's like Russian. Yeah. Rabbit yeah, the spirit. puka. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a film adaptation of a play. Um, and Jimmy Stewart was the lead back in the, I think that one was a 40s movie. Maybe it was the 30s. 1950s. Okay. Yeah. But I, I love that movie. I love Harvey. And I think there could be a lot of really fun things we could do now with like the technology we have, you know. Mm -hmm. But my only stipulation is if that were to be redone, mm -hmm. James Corden cannot be involved at any point because he is a piece of shit and he's creepy and I don't like him. And he's always in, he's always in things that like he shouldn't be because he seems like kind of an asshole of a person. So like James Corden, mm -hmm. if you're listening, you do not touch Harvey. Harvey is not for you. Fuck do you. not pass go. <laughs> do not collect $200. No. Go straight to jail. No, qu like no question. I find it really funny that you chose an older movie because the first one that came to mind for me was Bringing Up Baby, which was... Yeah, that would be a good one too with Katherine Hepburn and Cary Grant. Yep, came out yeah. in 1938. Oh my God, And I'm trying to think who I would want to be in it. I think it would be Ryan great Reynolds. with... Ryan Reynolds would be a good... <gasps> what Cary about Grant. Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively? Blake Lively would be a good Katherine Hepburn. That could be a really cute... Yeah. That could be super cute. Yeah. TM, TM, TM. That could and be Pedro super Pascal cute. Pedro Pascal can do Harvey because Pedro oh, Pascal yeah. could have, he's like friendly enough and like kind of like the quote unquote man of the people esque that Jimmy Stewart was in that film specifically. Or like Oscar Isaac, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yep. He would be a good one too. But yeah, bringing up baby would be a really cute like husband and wife film for them. Anyway, so <laughs> if you haven't seen either of those movies, Give Do them a so. watch because they're both really good. So yeah, I hope that answer is satisfactory, Carrie Ann. <laughs> and on that note, what's something good you'd like to share? Something good. My one good thing is that Willie turned nine this week. What? Willie, if you don't know, is my now nine-year-old clean bill of health. He just had his like senior blood work done. He's super healthy. He's just a little fat, but like... <laughs> <laughs> and sassy. I mean... Who doesn't get a little bigger in the winter? He'll be fine. We're working on it. But it's his ninth birthday. He's my diabetic alert service dog. He has already saved my life twice in the seven years we've been matched together. And so pretty much the entire month of January is a celebration of Willie because his birthday is on the 5th and his like quote unquote gotcha day, like the day he moved in was like the 27th of January. So mm -hmm. I assume that like, Everyone should be celebrating this dog because he's the best and he's awesome. But yeah, you should know about him. He's my something good all the time, but something good mm -hmm. even more because it was his birthday. Nice. He had steak. <laughs> As he should. Yes. Happy belated birthday, Willie. Yeah. Yeah. That's my good thing. What about you? Oh, we've got a couple author interviews coming up. I mentioned that. There's one I'm really excited about, which is going to be a cramp word segment. We were connected through my friend Becky, mm -hmm. who is from the podcast Too Stupid to Live. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. And I'm very excited to talk to him and his episode will be coming out later this month. So stay tuned for that. Shall we? We shall. A great way to support the show. If you want to help us out, but you can't do so financially, is to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, Podcast Addict, or Audible, or even just sharing the show with people that you know. Yeah. Got something you want to say? Shoot us an email over at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story ideas, 
see any gifts you send our way, or if you just want to say hello. We're pretty friendly. Speaking of friendly, if you'd like to have real-time conversations with us, consider joining our Discord over at the Cultivate Network. You can chat with us over at the Old Crimers Cubby, or catch up with any of the other great creators that are part of the Cultivate family of podcasts. Just click the link in our show notes or over on our link tree to get started today. We will also be having a sale at our Tea Public shop January 11th through the 14th, where you can enjoy 35% off. Ooh. If you're interested in ad-free content, consider supporting us with a one-time donation either over on Buy Me a Coffee or our Venmo page, both of which are in our link tree and in the show notes. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime. <laughs>